Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, some other people may join us. I'm Sue Greenberg, and I'm with Volunteer Lawyers and Accountants for the Arts. Very happy that you're with us this evening. For those of you who aren't familiar with what we do, we provide legal and accounting services, sponsor professional development programs like this webinar, and support efforts that help sustain our bi-state arts community. I'd like to thank the Missouri Arts Council, the Regional Arts Commission, and the Illinois Arts Council for supporting what we do. One of Zoom's silver linings has been connecting with artists, lawyers, authors from all around the country. Our registration list for tonight included attendees from Florida, Arizona, Michigan, Rhode Island, and Kansas. When I read about Gamal Hennessy's book, I reached out to him and he immediately agreed to speak. He's joining us from New York. And Steen Stewart is here in St. Louis and I know you're gonna enjoy their presentation. So if you have questions, please use chat and then we'll see how it goes. We have a nice small group and we may decide to unmute you uh, and have some uh, discussion towards the end so that we can have some real back and forth. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steens and she's going to get us started. It's all yours, Steens. Thank you. So I just shared my screen. Can you double check for me, you guys? Can you see everything? Looks it's good. good. Great. Okay, so my name is Steens. I am a cartoonist, editor, and educator here in St. Louis. I did the book Archival Quality, which, as we just talked about, uh, three years ago. Um, I'm also the cartoonist on the nationally syndicated comic strip Heart of the City, which you can read in St. Louis Post-Dispatch or many other newspapers and gocomics.com. Uh, my next book that I actually start working on tomorrow is called Side Quest. It is a graphic novel history of tabletop role playing games. Um, I'm co uh, writing and, and illustrating that. Um, I'm also currently a cartooning professor at Webster University. Um, so some of the things that I like to do um, besides obviously teaching, which is great, um, is you know doing these kinds of programs to talk to people about the business side of comics because you know when you're in art school it's very much like here's the craft here's how to make what you want to make but they don't oftentimes go into detail about how do you survive doing that you know how do you keep a roof over your head with um this area that you've gone into so um i'm very glad that we have uh gamal here with us to to talk um, I'm just going to kind of go through some things that I've done and then I'll introduce Gamal. Um, you can see here some of my art. Um, I always like to do uh, fan art. Um, I think it's really important to tell people that you draw what you like. And what I like is reimaginings of characters and doing that led me to get my job doing uh, Heart of the City. Um, I do comics that are on nonfiction topics like the importance of voting. Um, I like to do uh, short comics about my life that may not always be the best looking comic, but the idea for me is to get a story out. And that's what's most important for me is for readers to walk away with something. Um, but I do really like nonfiction work. It's really a lot of fun for me. Um, here's the cover for Archival Quality, which was my first book, but I also uh, contributed in anthologies. So like Dead Beats, Elements Fire, um, Mine, Fairy Fire, uh, power and magic. So I, I do all of these um, anthologies because they're a really great way to continue to uh, better get your craft going, but it's also a great way to learn about working collaboratively. Um, you learn how to prepare your pages for uh, print, um, knowing the color differences. So it, it's not something that it, it pays a whole lot, but it pays a lot in experience. Um, I also do editorial, so I've edited a uh, magazine for uh, uh, D&D &D, um, homebrew called Rolled and Told. I edit for superhero comics, for web comics turned, uh, published comics. Um, I have worked with smaller public, uh, publications like uh, Mad Cave Studios and Tapas, and I am currently working on Heart of the City. 
Heart of the City is what I've really spent most of my time on because it is a daily comic. So I have to do 365 comics a year, you know? Um, but when I got this gig, the first thing I did was um, uh, change the characters and it, make them so that they are more appropriate for a 2020 audience, or I guess now 2021. Um, so yes, that is what I do. Here's a couple of strips. Um, anyone can read Heart of the City on gocomics.com. I would love it if you did because <laughs> I like it <laughs> and I think that other people will like it as well. Um, I also expanded the family as well. Um, it used to just be about Heart and her mother and her friend Kat and Dean, but there's so many more stories that you can get when you bring in family members and you bring in friends and um, expanding her world was one of the first things that I had to learn to do when I was working on this project. So um, before I get into introducing Gama, I just want to let you guys know you can always email me or find me on Twitter and Instagram at ohaysteens or ohaysteens at gmail.com. I love to answer questions as needed. So uh, if you ever have a question about anything, please send me an email. So Gamal Hennessy is here with us, which is, thank you so much for being here. It's really, really exciting to have someone who uh, actually does the work to talk about uh, the business of comics. Um, so Gamal is an experienced entertainment contracts attorney and author from New York. His expertise in comic book publishing and comic IP li licensing is incredible. Um, during his career, he's represented major corporate clients like Aftershock, Amazon, Mad Cave, Marvel, as well as individual creators and small publishers, which we love to see. <laughs> so uh, go ahead, Gamal, you can take it away and we'll get right into your presentation. Fantastic. I'm going to share my screen. So Steens, if you can let me know if you guys can see it, we yep. can get started. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, Thank you everybody for taking the time out on a Monday in the winter during a pandemic to actually listen to a presentation like this. So I'm gonna try to provide some information that might be helpful to you if you're actually thinking about making comics. Um, the first thing that I need to say is that this discussion is gonna be a basic overview about the business of independent comic book publishing. It's not going to focus on other aspects of the industry like freelance comic book publishing or creator owned pop comic book publishing or anything like cross media deals where comic books go into other media. But what you will find is that if you understand the basics of independent comic book publishing and the entire process that goes along with it, all those other pieces will be much easier to understand and move into if you decide that's where you want to go. And we'll talk about that a little bit towards the end. Um, before I get started, I would actually like to just elaborate a little bit on my background and where I came from so you understand how this process was developed and whether or not you know listening to me makes any sense in the first place. So I started out in about 1999 at a Japanese animation and manga company called Central Park Media. And the job there primarily was to take properties, take books and movies that had already been released in Japan and then license them for the United States and release them here in English. In addition to a lot of um, contract work and a lot of distribution contracts. I did that for about four years until Marvel decided that they wanted to break into the Japanese market, which was much harder for them to do because they Japan had such a strong manga industry inherently in the country. It wasn't like a company like Marvel could just walk in and say, buy our superhero comics the way they can in like South America or Europe or anything else. So in addition to helping them manage their international portfolio, I also was handling a lot of the merchandise related agreements because that was around the time that Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man had come out and Ang Lee's Incredible Hulk had come out. So there was a lot of merchandise surrounding those properties in relation to the movies and a lot of deals with our talent, writers, artists, colorers, letterers, who would come in to do the individual books for Marvel. I did that for about two years. And then because 
my time at Marvel showed me that there was a real need for independent artists and writers to kind of have legal support and legal advocacy. I started a company called Creative Contract Consulting, which actually helps comic book creators of any size, whether they were small or large, actually understand and negotiate the contracts that they were working with to get their products out into the world. I did that for about, it's going on 16, 17 years now. And I am currently the um, general counsel and vice president of content for a new marketing and distribution company called Global Comics, which is trying to actually raise the profile of digital comics, not just in North America, but in other regions around the world. So there's much, we could try to get much more cross pollination of comics from one country and one culture into another. Now it's over this 20, 22 year career that I've actually developed the concepts that is gonna go into what we're gonna talk about to this evening, which is the process of independent comic book publishing. Now, when you talk about independent comic book publishing in this kind of framework, you're basically talking about three main components. The, in the beginning, you have the pre-production process, which is where you gather all the resources that you'll need to produce a comic, and you'll make all of the major decisions in how you want that comic to go, because comics is not a one-size-fits-all kind of system. There are a lot of different ways you could actually tell your story and bring your story to the community, and you'll make those decisions in the pre-production process that will make it much easier when you actually go to make the comic because you'll know what you're making and what resources you have to make it. So the production process itself is what people traditionally think about when they think about making a comic. You're talking about scripts, art, lettering, coloring, all of those different things. The post-production process is where you release that story into the world in whatever format you decide in exchange for some type of compensation. Now, <clears throat> the reason this is in three circles and not in a linear um, format is because within each of the major aspects, there are several decisions that have to be made and several steps within those decisions that encompass each one of the three parts. And also, there are, is a certain amount of overlap between when you're doing your pre-production and when you're doing your production, and also between production and post-production, primarily in the terms of marketing and advertising. But once you actually understand the overall process, it's, be, it's gonna be much easier to break each piece down to understand what decisions need to be made and how those decisions are going to impact your comic book overall. So, we should start at the beginning. And at the beginning, the fundamental existential question is, why did you decide to make comic books in the first place? Because if you are a creative person with a story to tell in the 21st century, there are many avenues that you could use to get your story out into the world. Comic books is a very unique industry that has a lot of, well, let's just put it this way. Comic books, the comic book industry is weird, okay? It is a strange, distribution model, and it has been since the 90s. There is an odd social stigma slash popularity with comics where people love the stories that come out of comics, but somehow feel like comics themselves are not worthy of attention in certain circles. So if you're going to make comics, and I believe anybody who's actually listening to this right now should be making comics, you have to ask yourself, well, why did you decide this particular story? needs to be a comic as opposed to anything else. You also have to think about what success means for you to have a comic. Because like I said, this is not a one size fits all kind of situation. And some people who have been my clients, they really just wanted to see their book on the shelf in a comic book shop next to all the other books that they like to read. Some of them, their aspiration was to win an Eisner Award. Some of them want to make, they want Netflix to call them and sell the rights for a TV show. Some of them just, they just want to get their story out, however that story comes out. And every one of those different types of models is a valid concept for success. But once you understand what it is you're trying to do, then all the other decisions that you'll have to make and all the other steps that you'll 
go through will be informed by that fundamental decision. You'll have that foundation to make all the other decisions for your book. And the first major decision is what story are you telling? Now, when you're talking about storytelling from a business perspective in comics, there are really only three types of stories. There is an original story where you make up everything on your own and you own the rights to everything that's being made. There is a public domain story where you're taking an idea that you don't own, but because the copyright has actually lapsed in a lot of historical stories, you are allowed to make any story you want with that character or with that universe because it's in the public domain. And finally, there is licensed stories where there is a pre-existing intellectual property that you get the rights to use and release a comic book. Each one of these different um, types of intellectual property has their own benefits and downsides. And the one you pick will be specifically related to what your goals are. For example, if you take a original idea like SMILE, the upside to that is you control the entire thing and you decide what the story is going to be and how the story is going to be told. The downside is no one knows what this story is. So you have to do additional work to build an audience and educate that audience on the story. Um, on the opposite side, if you get a license to do something that is already a pre-existing property, you are inheriting that fan base and that market but that's going to actually cost you money because very few intellectual property holders who have the rights to anything are going to give you the right to make a comic book for free. They're also going to be, in most cases, heavily involved in how that story is told and what you can and cannot do. The public domain is not necessarily a solution to both of those problems either because you don't have to pay to get a license to use a public domain character. But because of the way copyright has been manipulated over the past hundred years, most of the public domain work is very old. We're talking 18th, 19th century. So unless you have a new spin on it, it's going to be very difficult to actually turn that into something successful, especially when you know everyone else in the world can make another story about that character. So each, you can take each one of these and decide based on where you want to go, move into like making your story. The fundamental concept though is you have to pick a story and you have to pick a set of characters that you love because you will be working with this story for months, if not years. This story, this comic could define your career in comics depending on how successful it might be. And because the process of independent comics is so involved, it does not make sense to invest the resources that it takes to get a comic book out if you don't love the underlying idea in the first place. Now, this is not what actually happens if you're doing freelance comics. If you're doing freelance comics, well, on a certain level, who cares? Because they're paying you money, so you take it and you move on. But if it's your comic and your process and your business, only work with a story that you love. And the first um, test of this love for your story comes in the form of your investment because it takes a certain amount of money to get a comic out into the world. Now, how much that comic is going to cost, who pays that money, when that money has to be paid back, if it has to be paid back at all, are all variables that you can influence one way or another. But it's going to be difficult for you to get a comic book out into the world, even if you try to do everything yourself without some form of investment. Now, to determine what kind, how much investment you need, that's where you would go back and you would actually develop a budget for the comic and not just for the creative aspect of the comic, but for the marketing, the sales, the printing, the distribution, the convention attendance, all of those other things. And then once you figure out your budget, you can decide where that money is going to come from. But those sources of money only boil down to two sources. There's your money, whether you're talking about your savings or doing freelance work to pay for it or selling things that you already own or other people's money. Talking about grants or using credit cards or loans or anything like that. So the important piece here is to actually get a 
firm grasp of where the money is coming from so you know exactly what you are capable of doing in terms of the development and the production of the book going forward. Now, once you actually have your idea, which in legal terms is an intellectual property asset, and you have the money that's going, the source of funding that's going to get this book out into the world, you have assets. And from a business standpoint, those assets need to be protected. Now in comics, there are two major ways to protect your assets. One is to develop some sort of corporate structure, whether that's an LLC or a corporation or a partnership, something that is going to be able to absorb the legal liability for this project outside of your own personal finances. And if you form a corporate entity, there's going to be certain tax benefits that you're going to be able to utilize if you set up the right format. So in, for example, if you're spending, let's say $10,000 on the creative costs of your comic, if you have a corporation or an LLC, that becomes a business expense that can be deducted from your personal income. And you could actually, that could actually have a benefit for you come tax time, which is now it's March, tax time is actually now. Um, so it actually pays if you're going to do comics, especially if you're going to do comics over the long term, to consider creating some sort of cor corporate entity to protect those assets. The second thing that you need to do, which is probably the more important thing, is to bring in professionals to help you protect the assets that you have. Now for your the money that you're bringing in, you should bring in an accountant who can help you with the budgeting and can help you with the taxes. From the legal aspect, you bring in an attorney who will help you with protecting the intellectual property, will help you with all the contract negotiations that you need to do and help make sure that your book comes out and does not violate any sort of regulations that will actually drain all the money from your enterprise. The third person that you should always consider bringing in is an editor who will actually protect the story itself to make sure that you have the best story that you can bring out into the world and help you manage that process of getting the story out into the world. Now, when I say bring someone in, I don't mean to hire like three people at six figures each to kind of manage this one comic, but come organizations like Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, um, independent attorneys who will actually come in on a short-term basis are the type of people that you can use to help protect your all of your investment and your assets before you actually bring your idea out into the world. Now, the first place you're going to bring your idea to is going to be the team that actually makes your comic. Now in the North American comic book production concept, comic book production is a fairly linear um, process. And most people understand the creative aspects of making a comic. We are talking about script, art, lettering, coloring, flatting, production design, editorial, and things like that. But there's also an equally important um, component of the business management for your comic, whether you're talking about marketing, print managing, distribution, and all those other things. If you don't have people working on both the creative and the business aspects of your book, you are limiting the opportunities for success for the book. Because for example, if you make a very good book, but no one knows about it, you, don't, you can't get it printed, it, no, and no one can actually buy it, you have a wonderful piece of art that you cannot share with the people who really want to read it. Conversely, if you have the greatest marketing, sales, and distribution team in the world, but you have no comic, well, you have no business. It takes both of these groups working together to actually elevate the potential for the comic. Now, I'm not suggesting that your comic needs to have a dozen people working on it because a lot in certain cases, the people who work on the creative side can also help with the business side. As long as you make sure that every aspect of the creation and distribution of your book is actually taken care of, then you know that you're in a much better place than if you actually only focus on the creative side. The next piece is probably the most neglected piece in comics and probably the most important piece in comics, which is answering the question, 
of who is going to actually read this comic. Because every story has an audience, but every story is not for everyone. And it is a mistake to work with any kind of field of dreams idea that if you actually build a comic, people will come and read it. That is not how comics have worked since, I don't know, the late 80s. At this point, there are so many different things that people can use to consume story or you can to spend their time. If you're not actually focusing on the specific group of people who are who have an affinity for your story, it is going to be much more difficult for your story to succeed. To actually understand who those specific people are, you have to look inside the story itself that you are building. Because the answer to the question of who the ideal reader for the book is, is in your script. It is in your characters. It is in the situations that they are in. The way I define an ideal reader is you look at four distinct components. The demographics, which is how that person is identified in society, whether you're talking about race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or any one of those components. Psychographics is what they enjoy, what they believe in, who they trust, and what their aspirational goals are. Their generation is where they actually fit in terms of time. Who is their age cohort? Are they a baby boomer? Are they from the silent generation? Are they millennial? Or any one of those aspects. And the genre is specifically related to the type of story that you have, whether you're talking about horror, mystery, science fiction, or any one of the subgenres. Once you actually go into your story and deconstruct it, you will be able to figure out exactly the type of person that would want to read your story and then focus a lot of energy and time on building a relationship and a community with them before the book comes out. So that by the time when the book does come out, they, you have an eager audience ready to actually consume your book. Once you understand who your ideal reader is, you can actually divide everyone in the planet based on their relationship to your book. And there's only two factors, how much they are interested in your story and how much they are interested in the medium of comics in general. Your core market, which is that tiny, tiny circle next to Calvin's head, is going to be all the people who enjoy the type of story you're telling and they enjoy comics. So for example, let's say you have a story that is very similar to Game of Thrones, but it is set in Aztec era, era Mexico. So, okay, everybody who likes Aztec era Game of Thrones and likes comic books will be in your core market. Those are the people that you want to talk to the most. And those are the people that you want to cultivate as the group that's going to be buying your book when the book comes out. The false market is all those people who like comics, but are not interested at all in any kind of Aztec Game of Thrones. In the same way that all of you who probably read comics, there are comics that you like and comics that you don't like. You don't like comics just for the sake of comics. It is the story inside. You don't want to spend a lot of time and energy trying to sell a comic to a person who doesn't like your type of story. You also don't want to spend a lot of time and energy trying to sell comics to people who like you as a person because they like you. They may not like Aztec Game of Thrones, and they may not like comics. So you don't want to put people, friends and family in a position of trying to support something that they don't really like. Now, the most interesting and perhaps the most untapped um, population in relation to your comic is a potential market. These are all the people who like the type of story you're telling, but at this stage do not read comics. The reason that this is such a exciting group of people is that you can actually recruit some of them, perhaps a small portion of them, but because that is such a large group, even a small portion will make a big difference in whether your comic succeeds or not. You can invite them to actually enter the wonderful world of comics through a story that you know they like. So anyone who's interested in ancient Aztecs, anyone who's interested in Game of Thrones might be interested in your story even if they don't read comics yet, and that's where you can actually grow your overall market. Now, as you can probably guess, the non-market is all those people who don't like your story, 
They don't like comics and they are the vast majority of the population of the planet. The bad news is it's gonna be very expensive to try to reach all those people and convince them to get your comic. The good news is you don't have to because you're not gonna get any of them anyway. So it makes much more sense to only focus on the core market and the potential market and pretty much ignore everyone else. That is the way Hollywood does it with films. That is the way um, books do it in terms of their demographics. That is the way you should do it in terms of how you put your comic out to give it, put it in that the position that it needs to be in. Now, once you actually understand who's reading the comic, you will then understand where that comic needs to live in order for people to buy it. Because there are a lot of different ways in the 21st century for people to get comics in a traditional sense, traditional being since like the late 80s, 90s, uh, comic book shops is where people associate getting comics from. But that is not the only place that people can get comics. And it may not be the best place for your comic, depending on who your market is and depending on who your story is. Because there are distribution channels like bookstores, libraries, digital distribution, convention distribution, non-traditional live events, when we go back to live events after the pandemic and everybody is vaccinated, depending on what story you're telling will actually inform you of where you should actually put the book. For example, let's go back to the Aztec Game of Thrones story. If the majority of comic book shops are actually focused primarily on modern day superhero comics, then it may not make sense to try to struggle with dealing with Diamond and getting into comic shops and dealing with all of those issues, if you know your market will never go into a comic book shop anyway, it makes much more sense for you to go to a bookstore. It makes even more sense to go to a bookstore that focuses on historical books or, you know, uh, South American, Native American culture, because those areas are actually where the people who are more interested in your book are going to be. So it's basically put your book where the potential readers will get it, not just put your book anywhere. And then you are in a much, you're gonna be, have much lower blood pressure and you're gonna, your book is gonna be in a better chance to succeed. Now that we've actually gone through all of those steps, we've really actually just gone through the pre-production process because now you are actually in a position to understand what book you need to make, how you need to make it, and the time frame for making. Because you know how much money you have to work with, with your investment, you know exactly what kind of book you can make. Because you know the capabilities of your team, you know where, how that book is going to actually come together in terms of time, in terms of your production schedule. Once you know what it, who it is your market is and who the readers are and what the competition is, you know what the expectations are for your story and how to actually build that story. And when, because you understand the distribution, you understand what format the book has to be in, how long the book has to go, and all those other things that are gonna actually position your book in the best place. Now, when I say having these business ideas impact the creative process of making a comic, I am not suggesting that the business ideas overshadow or dominate the creative process. Because at the end of the day, you are creating narrative art, and the, art, the artistic and creative aspects should always be um, center stage, but all of the business considerations should inform those creative decisions so that they can actually work hand in hand to give you the best product possible. Now, close to the end of your production process, after you've actually cultivated your market and your community, it will be time to inform them that the book is actually ready to come out. But when we're talking about advertising, we are not talking about traditional aggressive advertising, like shouting into the void, buy my comic, buy my comic, buy my comic. A, because it doesn't work and B, because it's very expensive. However, if you've already created a market, you've already cultivated those relationships, all you're really doing at this stage is informing people about something that they want to already buy and giving them the information that they need to pick it up. So whether you do that through advanced reviews or you're working with the comic book press or you're doing sponsorships or you're doing social media marketing, 
it's going to be a very specific and very narrow targeted situation where you're really just talking to the people who want to hear from you anyway. And that way you get the best kind of results from your advertising efforts, which leads to sales and actually making money from your book. The amazing thing about comics in the 21st century is that there are several different ways that a comic can generate revenue. There are three primary ways that it boils down to. There is indirect sales, direct sales, and crowdfunding. Direct sales is something that is very specific. You're sitting at your convention table, someone walks up, I wanna buy a comic, you hand them the comic, they hand you the money, it's instant, it's great. Indirect sales is some, might be something like affiliate marketing on your website or advertising on your website where you're aggregating the attention that your comic gets, that you're giving away for free into another form of revenue. Crowdfunding is using something like a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo to leverage the crowd that you have and the story that you're telling into a specific revenue stream. Now, each one of these are not mutually exclusive. You could, in certain circumstances, use all of the different sales methods to generate revenue. It all depends on what your story is, who your market is, and what they are, are and are not willing to buy, and how, you, how much money you had to actually position the book in all of these different channels. As when the money comes in, there's going to be a balancing act that you have in terms of your sales. Because depending on the distribution method that you use, there's going to be a certain time frame of when you actually get paid for the book that you sold. So we take our convention example, that is immediate money, cash in hand. You give them a comic, they give you money. But if you're actually doing bookstore distribution, it might be six months or a year before they you know, re reconcile returns and then actually pay you for the books that you um, already sold. So you have to keep track of all the distri different distribution methods that you release the book into when the um, normal payments roll in. So you're not leaving money on the table for books that might've been sold months ago because you simply forgot to, to keep track of it. Then the other, because the other side of it is there may, there's going to be money going out the door for this book, whether it's because you um, took out money from a third party in terms of loans that need to be paid back, or there's outstanding payments to your creative or business team that you have to do in terms of direct payments or royalties. There may be taxes that need to be paid. There may be printing charges that need to be paid. So you have to make sure that the, or to the best of your ability, make sure the money coming in and the money going out doesn't leave you in a negative situation because there have been times that I've seen successful books, books that have actually sold well, um, the creator wound up losing money simply because the money coming in and the money going out didn't balance um, in their accounts. Now, after you've gotten through this whole process, you have, you are an independent comic book publisher. But in the same way that a musician or an athlete can't get to the Hall of Fame with just one book or, I mean, one game or one song, it's very hard for you to have a long-term comic book career if you only release one comic book. The good news is that once you actually have gone through this process, there are several different directions that you can go. You can continue to publish independent comics learning from your initial experience and then either building on the story that you started or coming up with new stories and you know working with that process again. You could move into freelance comic book publishing where you take these skills and experience that you have and you help other people release their comics in exchange for a fee. You can do creator-owned or creator-driven comic book publishing where you work with a third-party publisher either a traditional publisher or a comic book publisher to release a book and then split the revenue with those, those individuals. Or you can take that idea and you can attempt to translate that into other media through licensing, whether that's film, whether that's merchandise, whether that's anything else. And these different paths are not mutually exclusive. So you could 
do some deals could be freelance, some deals can be independent. You could actually spin off merchandise. You could do it all at the same time, depending again, just go back to the beginning, what your goals are, where you wanted to go, and how you actually saw yourself in the comic book industry. So to, to wrap everything up, um, I believe we're going to actually share this um, slide deck with everyone. So you don't, you can take a picture of it if you want, but we're going to give it to you anyway. Um, this is basically the process boiled down into one slide. Section items one through seven, which is the most important part of the whole process, is the pre-production process. The production process is basically just step D. And steps nine through 13 is going to be your entire post-production process and then spinning, circling right back around into the pre-production process for the next book. Because in many cases, the revenue and the intellectual property and the lessons learned from one book instantly carry over into the next book so that your, your process keeps um, evolving and you keep getting better at creating comics. Now, it took me about, well, it took me longer than I thought. Um, I've actually dumped a lot of information on you in a very short period of time. So you're probably sick of hearing me talk. But if you have questions later on, my email is here. We also run a um, group on Facebook because there's news and information and things are changing in the industry all the time. So to keep everyone abreast of that and to have pe give people the opportunity to share their information, we have a Facebook group. If you want more information on the legal and business consulting services that I provide, you can go to that website. And if you want to find me on Twitter, it's really easy. It is Gamal Hennessy. And that's pretty much my show. So um, if we want to open it up for questions, I'm ready. I think we're going to start with Steens' questions. Is that right? Okay. Yes. So we'll start with mine and I'll, I'll ask you a few. And then while uh, we're talking to, through our first couple of questions, if you want, you can put in the chat the questions that you'd like to ask, and then we can uh, address them as they come in. So one of the questions that I, I wanted to talk about at one point in the presentation, you, you talked about considering time um, because it takes time to make something and, you know, um, so I was wondering, what are some realistic times that you believe are usually spent on like contracting? Because I know you were saying earlier, you know, when you get a book advance, sometimes you don't get the, you know, you don't get the entire advance right there uh -huh. or contracting can take, I don't know, what are the time periods for contracting? Well, it depends a lot on who you're actually working with and how much leverage you have. Leverage being mm -hmm. the ability for you or the other side to get what they want in relation to the other part. So if you're working with someone as an independent comic book publisher and you're hiring like a letter, the idea that they're gonna be signing a work for hire contract, it's not gonna be that long, it's not gonna be that complicated, it's pretty straightforward. That should, I mean, at the for my clients, it usually only takes a week or two for that mm -hmm. to get done. However, uh, there's a flip side of that. If you're actually getting a deal with a major publisher like a you know penguin random house and you have an agent and you have you know there's a lot of moving parts in all of that just finding the right party to start negotiating a deal could take six to eight months the contract itself could take another year to do in reality you might have made two or three comments while you're actually negotiating the contract for this one so it's not, it is not, a, is not a fixed number. There are variables that all boil down to the complexity of the deal at hand and the, um, the relative positions of the parties. That's great. I think it's super important for anyone to, getting into comics to know about time management and to temper their expectations when it comes to time management as well. Mm -hmm. Even as a creator, um, time management comes in from not just the production process and, and understanding how long it's going to take you to create a comic, but also the pre-production of an actual drawing. So the thumbnails and the script, and depending on who you're working with, some people may have 
um, more visual literacy than others. And so sometimes editors will take a while to go through uh -huh. thumbnails because they're not used to reading it like that, you know? So I definitely think it's very important for um, anyone trying to get in to understand that things can take time. They don't always go as fast as, you know, people make it out to be. You get a book deal and all of a sudden you're Stan Lee, you know? <laughs> Well, one of the things that I actually recommend to people, especially if they're going to make their own comic, is to build your team and start small with your team. So like if you, you're bringing in an artist and you're bringing in um, a colorist and a flatter, then have instead of throwing them in to do the entire you know 22 page book or 96 page graphic novel, have them do two pages. Mm -hmm understand how long it takes them to do the two pages, what you have to do in terms of back and forth for the two pages, and how these people actually work together. And if you find, well, okay, it takes them a week to do two pages. Well, okay, now if it's 22 pages, then it's going to take them about 10, 11 weeks. And now you know that because you've actually built that system. You might find that it takes them a month and a half to do two pages. And then you go, okay, this may not be the right group of people because right. it just took me a month and a half to get two pages. And that may seem like wasting time because you're not actually doing the book that you plan on doing. However, if you're talking about marketing, that all those two pages, those two, those test pages that you're building can be what you're actually using for your social media marketing, what you can be using to build your website. So it's not wasted content that you're creating even if it never makes it to the final book it could be like the extra stuff that you put in the back of the trade paperback it yep. could be a perk that you actually have for the crowdfunding and the other thing is it's much better to waste a month figuring out whether these people can actually make two pages than to waste two years realizing that they can't make 22 pages it's better to have them try and fail early than burn through a year and a half of your life your money doing something that they ultimately cannot do. Right, very good. Uh, so you have a question from the audience. Um, Ken Jackson uses a character in the public domain, yes. um, but they've created a new story with them and created an original character, series, et cetera. Mm -hmm. How far do their rights expand as, that, as their intellectual property? Well, when you're talking about using public domain stuff and then creating what's called a derivative work and then copywriting that derivative work, that is, you have just described basically most of Disney's business model. <laughs> because they, that's, well, before they bought Star Wars and Marvel, that's pretty much all they did. They took public domain stories, they made their version, they copyrighted and trademarked their version, and then they made billions of dollars. So as if, as long as you're sure that the character that you're using is in the public domain and you you can go through an ip review for that and as long as you actually take the steps to protect that new version that new intellectual property you should be fine it worked for walt disney it can work for you too so i would like to know um let's say you live in a small town mm -hmm. would you say that it's harder or easier for folks who aren't living in big cities to get their comics off the ground? How do you think their location affects their business choices? Well, the magical thing about comics is that they are geographically decentralized. It is not like making a play or making a movie where everyone has to be in the same space. You can, people who actually create comics, and this has been true for decades, can literally, every person can literally live anywhere in the world as long as they actually have access to the internet and a cloud server. So there is no, necessarily, there's no downside to living in a small town if you want to create comics. The benefit to living in a small town if you want to create comics is there may be significant cost of living savings that you can use to funnel your investment because if you're not living in New York, you don't have to have a day job and then drive an Uber and then be a bartender to actually afford to live in the place and then find time to make comics. You can just go home and make comics <laughs> because it doesn't cost you $5,000 for a studio apartment. So there are certain benefits when you're talking about comic books 
and the production process, especially since most of the time comic book people, even if they live in the same city, they don't see each other that much because they're in their studio, they're making their comics. The only time that they actually see each other is conventions, when you actually can go to conventions, and bar con, mm -hmm. which actually happens at conventions as well. But that's, you know, that's when the comic book people come together. But you can live in a small city and make and have a thriving comic book career. It's actually some in some cases it's easier. Yeah, yeah, I do like to make sure that people understand that just because there's oftentimes that imagery of, you know, all the artists working in, you know, one building and that's just, you know, it's not how it is anymore. And yes. oftentimes you find, uh, you get surprised by how close people may be, you know, uh, Chris Samney is really, really close. Jason Aaron is also in uh, really close as well. So, you know, it's it's good to, to remind folks that um, yes. where you live is not, always going to be uh, a hindrance on your dreams, which is great. Yes, because I mean, back in the day, historically, if you wanted to be a comic book artist, you had to leave your small town. Yep. You had to go to New York. You had to drag your portfolio to all the different studios and then hope that you can get work. Yeah. Nobody at Marvel or DC wants you to walk into their studio right now. No. <laughs> don't, don't, please don't do that. They don't, not at all. Security, you will not get past security. <laughs> so you are, you are much better off staying where you are and working for Mar work for Marvel, work for DC, work for Valiant, work for everybody, but yep. stay home. It's fine. Yep. It's fine. We have another question from the audience. Um, how important is it to find an agent in the publishing process? If you're talking about independent comic book publishing, you do not need an agent at all. If you're talking about creator-owned or creator-driven comic book publishing, and your goal is to actually work with a traditional publisher, whether that's a Penguin Random House or Scholastic, then it is much more important to find an agent. Um, again, go back to part one, which is why you're making comics. If you're making comics because you want a mainstream deal, then you need a mainstream agent. If you're making web comics that you're gonna release them on Tapas or Global Comics or something, you never need to talk to an agent at all. It all depends on what it is you're trying to do and how it is you're trying to get there. Yes. And I would say that the majority of comic creators who are doing creator-owned work, so like Raina Telgemeier, who does mm. Smile and mm. all of that, they all have agents. I have an yes. agent as well. And that's because I want someone to protect me when we are working with a larger corporation. You know, yes. um, it sucks to say, but it is true that sometimes corporations will take advantage of artists if they don't know. <laughs> it's, not, it's not sometimes. It's actually yeah, it's every time. time. Yeah, if, the if they find an opportunity to take advantage of someone, they will. Mm -hmm. I have been in that position before. <laughs> so um, I think it like, you know, like Amal said, it's 100% what it is that you want to do, you know. Um, what is one of the worst things you've seen in a comics contract? You look at it, and you're just like, don't sign this. <laughs> Okay, well, there's going to be, I'm going to give you a general concept, and then I'm going to give you a specific example. The general concept is, and this is specifically related to creator-owned deals, where a publisher will tell a creator, I'm going to publish your comic, so I'm going to give you a publishing deal. But then you read the contract, and it is not a publishing. What it is, is a wholesale theft of intellectual property rights. They are taking the publishing rights, the movie rights, the copyright, the film and television rights, the interactive rights, the rights to the sequels, the prequels, all the underlying intellectual property forever, and you can't get it back, and they're giving you no money. Congratulations, you have a publishing. These are the types of things that you tell your clients, at least in my position as a comic attorney, do not sign them. In fact, do not even attempt to negotiate this because their entire business model is based on exploitation. Please don't do that. Now, the sad reality is that I wanna say 40 to 50% of the people that I tell not to sign it will, will sign it because this, is the, this may be the first time they've ever gotten a bite on their story, a story they work, have been working for for five years and they feel like if they don't say yes to this, they may never get another shot. Right. But getting a bad deal is far worse than getting no deal. 
especially if you're living in a time period where you can get the book out yourself and keep all the rights. So that is the general worst thing that I see in, in uh, comic book contracts. And that is actually fairly common. The absolute worst thing that I have seen, I actually saw three months ago, where a contract basically said a person was going to get a page rate for the art that they were producing, but they had to produce the artwork within a certain period of time, and that was fine. But their page rate was going to be held by the publisher until 90% of North America was vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus. Now, you don't need to be an attorney to understand that there is no way that that statement, A, has any relevance to making comics, especially if I already gave you the pages. Why are you holding on to my page rate until a public health crisis is 100% alleviated? And who is actually determining when 90% of the population is vaccinated? And how are we going to figure that out? And what are you talking about? <laughs> this is something that was actually in the contract. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the worst wow. thing that I have seen. And you know, contracts aren't just from you know creator to legal department. Other people see the contracts as well. So for example, an editor will see a contract um, because usually the editor is the middleman between legal and the creator. Mm -hmm. And one that I saw that was, I, I could not sign that, I could not at all, was um, one of the agents for a creator that I was hiring wanted to put a clause in the contract that says that she will still get paid even if she does not turn in the work. And that makes no so sense. Why am I, why am I paying? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I might as well just give you the money now and stop talking to you if you can yeah. get paid for not doing work. For not doing I anything, I know. So this is to say... Con con bad contracts will never go away. And it's always important to uh, keep an eye on um, what's good for you. Uh -huh. um, okay, we have about two minutes left, but if you're okay with answering this question in that amount of time, no. okay. We can answer any question you want, it's fine. It's fine. Great. Uh, so you mentioned getting a corporation in order to protect your assets. Um, can you also do that as a sole proprietor at LLC? Absolutely. When you're talking about creating a corporate, um, a corporate form, you're not necessarily talking about a logo, a building, an office, a, a group of people. You're not talking about any of those things. You're talking about creating a legal structure, which it actually only exists on a piece of paper that is registered with the state that you happen to have formed the corporation in. So a lot of times my clients will create what is called a single member LLC which is a company that actually gives certain tax benefits, certain legal liabilities, but it is for all intents and purposes, one person. You are the whole company, but there's a separate, it's just a separate legal entity. There's you as an individual who might own a house, a car, whatever. And there's the company that actually owns the intellectual property that actually signs the contracts that actually has the bank account. So you can, and in many cases you should, especially if you're not working with anyone in particular on a long-term basis, just set up a structure of a corporation where there's just one person and that's you. That's great. Um, okay, so we're at 7.30 or at CST. So this is the end, um, but I wanted to thank you all for your incredible questions. I know we can talk about this sort of thing forever. <laughs> and thank you all for your very succinct uh, presentation. It really covered quite a bit in a short period of time. So I'll pass it back I, to I want, I'm gonna jump in too and, <laughs> and thank uh, Eustines and Gamal. That was absolutely excellent. And thank everybody for being with us tonight. We're going to send you um, the link uh, so that you can watch again, uh -huh. uh, or you know, look for something that maybe you want or that you missed. Uh, we'll have the slide deck for you. And uh, tomorrow, I'm also going to send you a reminder to fill out the evaluation form uh, so that we can get feedback from you. It's very important for us to hear from you in our planning uh, and also to report to our grant makers. 
So um, with that, I think we'll call it an evening. And again, uh, thanks to everybody. And I'm very much looking forward to the time where we can be gathering again. Uh, but um, you know, the idea of having them all with us from New York is so fantastic. And um, so there'll still be Zoom in our life uh, come the fall and into next year when things get hopefully uh, back to normal. So anybody else with something that you just can't live without getting an answer to? Otherwise, we will call it a night. All right. Thank you to all of you. It's great. Thank you. Thank you, you sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. No worries. No worries. All right. Have a good night, folks. Stay safe out there. Bye.